Hello everyone and welcome back to this next part in our feature engineering mini-series. And this part is actually not really about feature engineering, but I would like to draw the connection between all sorts of feature engineering or extraction techniques that we have seen until now, you know, like choosing dictionaries or using the SVD for linear feature extraction from data, autoencoders for extracting features in, in a nonlinear fashion. And what about deep learning, right? This is the most popular learning technique by now for many, many applications, for instance, in, in image analysis or audio classification and so on, natural language processing. So why do they work so well and what do they have to do with features in a sense, okay? And so this is the, the model that we have been using in, in many, many situations that we have a linear model in terms of our weight, which means we have weights times and then some feature representation of our input Z. Right? These could be the autoencoder, an SVD matrix, a dictionary, and so on. And so if we compare this to deep learning, then we have a completely different perspective, okay? So our output is some, this is a neural network, function of our input. And this looks usually like this, okay? So let's say we have L layer, so this is the L weight. I will draw a picture in a minute. Um, times and then some activation function sigma of the second to last layer, which, we, we, which would be W L minus one times, you know, the input or the output of the, the second to last layer. And this is again sigma of a function of the layer from before and so on. So what we will get in the end, once this series here, or the sequence uh, completes, is sigma of w1 times z, okay? And so because this looks so uh, abstract, let's draw a small picture and, and, you know, try to visualize this in a bit. Okay, so what we have here is our input Z, and then we have our first hidden layer, right? The architecture doesn't matter for now, this is just a feed-forward network, which has, you know, these very nice fully connected layers, and they have weights. So W1 is, now it's a matrix, all the weights in the first layer, and then this proceeds, right? So you have your second hidden layer, you know, again, some connections, next hidden layer, some connections, and for all of these you have your weight in the kth layer, until the very end, where you have your last layer, W, L now, okay? and this then gives you the output Y. And in many, many situations, also in the way I have drawn it here, the last layer is a linear layer. Right? So this allows us to have outputs for, of arbitrary size, just the real valued output. But you can also have activation functions if you want this to be binaries or if you want these to be probabilistic statements, you have sigmoids. But let's stick with this for now. And then let's see that this actually is a lot different from our simple feature representation, right? So here we have this network, this concatenation of nonlinearities, and you see exactly what's happening here. You put in the Z, multiply it with W1, and then wrap the activation function around this. And this is now your first latent state, and then you repeat, right? You apply the second weights, wrap the activation function around it. You apply, you know, do this back and forth and, and so on. Apply the kth weight activation function until you apply the final activation function and then have your linear output layer. And so is this very, very different? Well, on first sight, we might say, yes, it is. But let's try to separate what's going on in the first layers from what's going on in the very last layer, okay? So what I can do now is that everything that's going on here is basically everything that's going on here until the very or second to last layer, okay? And so now let's compare these, right? So what we get is something like a feature weight drop, okay? So it's a really complicated nonlinear feature transform. But if you look at it, actually this is really what's going on here. So D1 
Deep learning actually is nothing else but the automation of feature learning. Okay, so maybe we don't know that a dictionary of polynomials is worth trying, or maybe SVD is too simple, um, or maybe we cannot do an autoencoder because you know we cannot compress the state to some dimension, or it's very hard to find out how to compress it, and so on. So what deep learning really is all about is a multi-layered feature identification or feature transformation. Okay, and so usually what you can say is uh, the, the further we proceed down, we go from simple features, you know, detecting edges maybe in, a, in an image, to more complex features, you know, concatenating edges to, to shapes like circles or faces, eyes, and so on. And then we proceed further down until we have a very complicated feature. And then it becomes easy to have a linear, let's say, prediction in terms of a regression vector or, or something like this. So we have multi-layered features, and usually these go from simple to complex. complex. And so this is really the secret behind deep learning and why it works so well. We have just automated the feature learning, right? And so it's clearly very, very powerful, you know, because, you know, these neural networks are universal function approximators. So basically this multi-layered feature vector can represent any transform from the input to some feature representation that allows for a linear prediction in the last layer. The problem, on the other hand, is that right, we have all these weights, so obviously we need a lot more data to tune our automatic feature identification. So as in all areas of machine learning, there's always this trade-off. If we have the sufficient amount of data to support an architecture like this, it's well destined to be very, very powerful and give you great performance. If we don't have the data to train all these weights, then you're better off with some manually selected features. Right? Even though they may not be as powerful as this, if you don't have the data, then you shouldn't try to, to train such a complicated system because it will very unlikely generalize to, to unseen data. Okay, so now we have seen all sorts of feature representations until the very last step here, in my opinion, to automatically learn features. And as a takeaway, just as I said, you know, you should make your choice according to the amount of data that you have. And maybe a combination of pre-computed features and then some additional layers that you need to train may be useful as well, right? So everything you can put in beforehand reduces the number of weights in these very general purpose deep learning architectures and thereby reduces the amount of required training data. So. I hope you have learned a bit about feature extraction and that these are really, really useful and also very important in many applications to, to make learning work. And yeah, see you in the next videos. Thank you.